Just let me talk about one of the very important topic in dermatology or in overall medicine actually. And we have not covered this topic anywhere till now because this specifically belongs to the dermatology field. That is leprosy or Hansen's disease. It is also known as Hansen's disease. Leprosy uh, is caused by mycobacterium lepre. You all know that. It is a type of acid fast bacilli. Okay, so this is a chronic infectious granulomatous disease, which is caused by mycobacterium lepre. You know the causative agent here. It mainly involves skin, mucosa, and peripheral nerve. See this, skin, mucosa, and peripheral nerve. Because of the involvement of this peripheral nerve, please mute yourself. Because of the involvement of peripheral nerve, it can lead to a different problem in sensation. Okay, the sensory nerves are mainly affected, and because of that, the loss of sensation occurs, especially in the extremities. And as a result of that, the person cannot feel whether it is hot, cold, or some other pain. So because of this, you know, severe loss of the tissues from that area may happen in a case of leprosy. And that, that what exactly happens in the older people. Now, we think they become ignorant, you know, but actually they don't feel what's going on there. So this is very, very important point here. It produces hypopigmented, hypoanesthetic lesion with or without gross deformity. In the beginning, these lesions are, okay, hypopigmented or hypoanesthetic. But later on, you know, they develop gross deformity, it means there is loss of the finger, there is loss of the nose, okay, uh, there is severe ulcer formation and all those things can happen in the case of leprosy. So it should never be ignored. And uh, if possible, it should be diagnosed in time so that those gross deformity will never occur. Let's move on. Now, leprosy is a disease which is known, known to us from a very ancient time. Okay, see this? From the, as early as 600 BC, this disease is known. And it is associated with tremendous amount of stigma and discrimination in the society. Now, let me elaborate on this. If a person is having scabby, sorry, a leprosy in the community or society, you know, what other people think of him? This person, uh, you know, must have done a lot of crime or sin, probably in the past life or in this life as well. So God has punished this person. So that type of stigma is still present in the society, not in only in one country, probably all over the world, especially the, you know, uneducated people, they think like that. But to tell you the truth, it is not caused by any of those things. It is caused by a bacteria, which is known as mycobacterium lepre. So, if we diagnose this disease in time and treat it well with the antibiotic cocktail, means the combination of antibiotic, the person is going to be all right very soon without any deformity. So, this particular point has to be instilled in the mind of those people who think. Uh, uh, this, okay, as a different type of problem. So this is the job of us, the job of a doctor who is going to treat this case. We not only treat the patient, but we treat those people, okay, whose belief is like that. Let's move on. Now, what type of organism is this? See here, so this is a bit of microbiology knowledge. This mycobacterium lepre is acid fast bacilli. It is aerobic and it is intracellular organism. Intracellular, it cannot grow outside the cell. And because of this important point, okay, this particular bacteria cannot be grown in artificial culture as well. There's no artificial culture media for the growth of mycobacterium lepre, like mycobacterium tuberculosis. We, we grow mycobacterium tuberculosis in which media? 
Which media? LJ media. LJ media. LJ media. Lowe Stone Jensen. Excellent. Very good. LJ media. Lowe Stone Jensen media, or sometimes even back text system. Okay, those can be used, but nothing like that for Mycobacterium leprae because it is purely intracellular organism. So we use animal models for the culture, like mouse foot pad and nine banded armadillo foot pad of the mouse, or there is one special animal called armadillo. Okay, uh, this armadillo is used for the culture of Mycobacterium leprae. And a little bit more knowledge about armadillo. These are wild animal. They look very small in size. And these sometimes are naturally infected with Mycobacterium leprae organism. So coming in contact with this armadillo may transmit the disease to us. But the chance is very rare, you know. But chances are there. Though the chances are less, chances exist. They can transmit leprosy to us. So uh, this is the, a bit of important information here. Uh, let's uh, look at this picture here. See this? These are acid fast bacilli. Okay. They look uh, a bit pinkish in color uh, when uh, you know, we do acid fast stain. Now, all of the uh, people will not get leprosy even if they come in contact with Mycobacterium leprae. Around 95% of the people are naturally immune to leprosy. Then what is the reason why some of the people develop leprosy? Now, this is explained by you know, some defective gene in them. And that defective gene is causing decreased cell-mediated immunity. So a bit of a genetic you know, factor to play the role. Now, regarding the transmission of leprosy, it's very interesting. Respiratory mode is the number one uh, transmission way or method for leprosy. This is by droplet infection. And the nasal mucosa, okay, or the nose is one of the common organ where they harbor this mycobacterium leprae organism. Studies have shown that leprosy can be transmitted to human by armadillo. Now, this leprosy is not known to be either sexually transmitted or highly infectious after treatment. So once treatment is started, you know, if this patient is no more contagious, that point has to be told very precisely to the family member. Otherwise, who knows, the family member themselves you know, are not treating this patient properly. I mean, they don't want to touch this patient thinking that, oh, this is a contagious illness and things like that, okay? So we need to be precise in the proper explanation. Only 5% of the population are in risk of leprosy. 95% are already immune. And the incubation period is as short as few weeks to as long as 30 years or even over or more than that. So very, very variable type of incubation period. And the average incubation period is between three and five years. So long incubation period regarding leprosy. So let's talk about pathogenesis. So how, how the disease occur? It has got very long incubation period. Host cell mediated immunity plays a big role in the disease. Why? because this organism is intracellular. And whenever intracellular disease occur in us, cell-mediated immunity plays a big role. Means if cell-mediated immunity is less, more chance of intracellular disease. Genetic factors play a role, but they are you know, not properly defined, okay? Just a bit of presumption or assumption probably. The basic pathology or basic pathogenesis is this WBC, which are present in our body like macrophages, they uptake Mycobacterium lepra inside them. And then Mycobacterium lepra avoid the lysosome toxins via its waxy coat. Means it will avoid the destruction by this lysosome toxin or 
you know, lysozyme via its pathogenetic factor, which is called waxicoat. So this, you know, uh, avoid the destruction. That is the meaning. Bacilli use leukocyte to cruise around the body to new location, uh, similar to mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is using the similar type of way. And inside the nerve, they can destroy Schwann cell. And we all know what is the function of Schwann cell, isn't it? What is the function? Schwann cell? Myelination. Myelination of peripheral. Myelination of nerves. Myelination of peripheral nerve. Okay, you have to add one more thing, peripheral nerve only, because Schwann cells are the cell which form myelin sheath in peripheral nervous system. So by attacking the Schwann cell, it leads to demyelination of the peripheral nerve, like cranial nerve and peripheral nerve or spinal nerve. Now, in the beginning itself, I like to clarify this point. For the diagnosis of leprosy, we need these three factors together. Okay, so there's a clear concept is there in the student mind. First, presence of skin patches during the examination. See here, presence of skin patches during the examination, which either the patient have complained from their side, so we can take this as a symptom, or we find it out during our examination. And one of the very important point there is, there's loss of feeling or loss of sensation on those skin patch. They are anesthetic patch. And that has happened because of damage of the nerves which you know, uh, innervate that area. Second, enlargement of the nerve. Okay? Enlargement of the nerve or thickening of the nerve. This is important one. So, we should feel some important nerves there. Now, uh, the nerves which are easily palpable during this uh, time are ulnar nerve, okay? Ulnar nerve, common peroneal nerve, common peroneal nerve, and great auricular nerve, great auricular nerve. Now, a little bit information about this, okay, though uh, later on also I'll, I'll explain about it. Now, where is Alnarna present? I mean, where, where can we feel Alnarna very easily? Yes? Uh, elbow joint. Very good. So, which? Medial which? side. Medial. 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 Very good. So, elbow joint, very good. So, uh, medial epicondyle of the elbow. So back side of medial epicondyle of the elbow, there is the ulnar nerve present. And we can even feel it, you know, in a normal people, this ulnar nerve can be rolled there. And if we feel ulnar nerve a little bit, you know, or tightly, then you can feel tingling and numbness sensation on the ulnar aspect of your hand. So, you know, ulnar nerve is right there. In case of leprosy, this ulnar nerve is thick. Very important point. Now, where is common peroneal nerve then? Where? Fibula around, the around, around the neck of the fibula. Excellent. Excellent. Around the neck of the fibula. Very good. So you just roll your finger there and you can feel it easily when it is thick. Okay. This is common peroneal nerve. And great auricular nerve is behind the ear on the upper part of the neck. Behind the ear on the upper part of the neck, on the lateral side, great auricular nerve, it can also be easily felt. Third point here is presence of mycobacterium lepre on skin smear. So you have to take this slit skin smear, okay? You have to cut a piece of skin there and send to the microbiology lab, okay? Then they will uh, give you the report, yes, Acid fast bacilli is seen there, which looks like mycobacterium leprae. Then you got the diagnosis of leprosy. So these three things are very important for the diagnostic purpose. Two of them are examination, one is investigation. Now let's classify leprosy. 
another important part of this lecture classification very commonly asked in the exam okay now this classification systems here one is done by who world health organization classification it roughly say pauci bacillary and multi bacillary pauci means very few number of organisms are present on the uh, skin or on that uh, slit skin smear and multi bacillary means abundant number of bacilli are present ridley joplin is another very well known classification of leprosy according to this classification uh, roughly it is divided into three types first okay there are tuberculoid lepromatous and borderline again borderline is divided into two uh, other types okay borderline tuberculoid and borderline lepromatous so all together we have five uh, you know uh, names there like tuberculoid borderline tuberculoid borderline borderline lepromatous and lepromatous so we are going to talk about that this is ridley joplin classification and immunological classification is about whether cell mediated immunity is intact or not if it is still there okay or good enough and on top of that if leprosy has happened then probably this is a case of tuberculoid leprosy whereas if cell mediated immunity is very low and if leprosy has occurred in the patient most probably this is lepromatous type of leprosy the most severe type so here now this is ridley joplin classification ridley joplin classification and uh, indeterminate means you know very suspicious type of lesion so this suspicious lesion may be present by some other conditions also or we cannot pinpoint which type of lepromatous you know or disease is this determinate means this is a definite type of leprosy now again they divide into tuberculoid borderline or lepromatous and this borderline is again borderline tuberculoid borderline borderline or you can only see let's say borderline here and borderline lepromatous so let's combine all these together tuberculoid is one borderline tuberculoid second borderline borderline or borderline third borderline lepromatous fourth and lepromatous leprosy fifth now if i go towards this side tuberculoid side it is less severe one when i go towards lepromatous side it is most severe one and this is right in the middle now what do you mean by this indeterminate leprosy what is the meaning of this term see here this is common in facial area it is more common in children and these macule which are present there are ill defined with or without nerve thickening with or without nerve thickening if they occur without nerve thickening then we confuse whether this is a case of leprosy or not that's why indeterminate type they may have hypopigmented patch or erythematous patch hypopigmented means you know it looks whitish there's loss of pigmentation erythematous means it looks red and it may be hypoesthetic or normal aesthetic okay now normal aesthetic means you know it it has normal feeling normal type of sensation hypo means decrease feeling that's why it is confusing you know that's why it is uh, terms as indeterminate leprosy so best way to diagnose it is take a smear from there take a slit skin smear send to the lab if the report yes there are presence of microorganisms there then your diagnosis is 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 confirmed then we do not call it indeterminate leprosy anymore this will go towards the determinate type another important variety of leprosy is tuberculoid leprosy okay according to the ridley joplin classification we call it tt now this is a localized lesion on the skin and usually single lesion is there which is the most common or in some other people few lesions are there 
most common shingle in other one or two more if there are many they are asymmetrical they occur here and there on the body they are well defined lesion means margin is well defined i can clearly see the margin they may be macule and they may be plaque now uh, let me uh, you know describe these terms once again to you because these are very important dermatological term macule means the size is less than 5 mm and it is just change in color of the skin it is neither elevated nor depressed on the skin this is called macule just change in skin color whereas plaque is okay uh, it is you know wide type of lesion okay wider means the transverse diameter is more than the vertical one it is definitely a bit elevated from the surface there is no doubt we can feel it or we can palpate it easily but it is more wider than it is coming up from the surface this is called plaque so this plaque or macule can be hypopigmented or can be erythematous hypopigmented is more common there may be loss of hair and there may be less sweating on that area because of damage of the nerves this is very very typical and we have to feel or palpate for the local cutaneous nerve or regional nerve trunk which are usually thickened in a case of tuberculoid leprosy now let's see some of the picture here have a look here this is a very typical lesion of tuberculoid leprosy see this now some of the differential diagnosis will immediately come into your mind what what is the common differential diagnosis which comes into your mind if you see this type of picture yes it could be burns sir or dermatitis allergic reaction good tinea infection tinea fungal infection tinea very good Tinea. now very good Number now the point. now the points are coming excellent you are absolutely right okay in case of dermatology you should keep your mind very open until and unless this is a typical type of lesion now it can be dermatophyte lesion or ringworm lesion absolutely it can be for example tinea corporis okay so if i am confused i will take the help of investigation i will take Uh, you know scraping from there and send for you know kos mount if they report me yes there are presence of mycelia then i will my diagnosis is change all together i am suspecting a very difficult type of disease like leprosy but you know it has come out to be a very simple infection like dermatophyte it can be you know a reaction to any prior skin wound or skin trauma sometimes what happen we had prior skin you know infection or skin wound okay a bit of scratch on the skin or a bit of abrasion maybe and later on that part will develop this you know hypopigmented area it's very common in the individual okay so these are considered some uh, differential diagnosis here now see this this is not uh, you know white looking it is a slightly different color than this so a important point here is i should check what is the sensation here okay check the sensation check pain touch and temperature and if all of these are absent then this is a case of lepromatous or leprotic lesion tuberculoid leprotic lesion this is a borderline tuberculoid okay uh, why it is called borderline tuberculoid because of a bit bit of a bigger type of lesion because of more active type of lesion and <clears throat> it is usually confirmed by the microorganisms which are seen there okay microorganisms are more in than typical tuberculoid one these are sometimes known as satellite lesion also now let's talk about the most severe type of leprosy which is known as lepromatous leprosy 
this is considered as a systemic disease in itself systemic disease because multiple systems and organs are involved here regarding the face it will lead to diffuse infiltration of the face there may be supraciliary medarosis now what do you mean by this medarosis anyone what is medarosis this may be a new term for you so supraciliary now this supraciliary medarosis means loss of eyebrow okay loss of eye brows so a uh, ciliary term we use for the eyelashes and above the eyelashes if we lose the eyebrows uh, then uh, you know these are called medarosis this is one of the common problem on the facial involvement of lepromatous leprosy different types of deformities can be there like the person may have nasal deformity very important one because lepromatous leprosy usually cause destruction of the nasal septa and what happens if the nasal septum is destroyed the nasal bridge is collapse okay and it looks deformed nose from outside when we examine if we examine some older patient with leprosy they usually present with nasal deformity this is the reason regarding the cutaneous lesion there may be macule or there may be papule as well as nodule papules are smaller type of nodule less than 5 mm in size nodule are the bigger one now what happens to the nerve now look here okay regarding the nerve they are symmetrically involved in this condition whereas in tuberculoid leprosy they are asymmetrically involved but here they are symmetrically involved they have thickened they are tender and they have globe and stocking type of anesthesia now what do you mean by this term globe and stocking anesthesia what is this so last one is peripheral part of the mild in the meat exactly exactly the peripheral part of our limbs or the distal part of our limbs are affected just like you know uh, you know the the area where we wear the globe and stocking okay stocking in case of female and globe you know in both sexes where we wear that that part is losing sensation that is called globe and stocking type of anesthesia in other word hands and feet are usually involved because peripheral neuropathy usually you know start from the distal part and slowly goes up regarding the systemic involvement lymphadenopathy hepatosplenomegaly eye lesion and even testicular atrophy may occur uh, because of lepromatous leprosy as a result of that it is considered a uh, you know systemic type of disease that is the reason whereas tuberculoid leprosy Uh, is not involving all these things you know so this is a localized or regional type of infection now look at this picture here okay all of you these are the common nerves which are uh, you know felt or palpable uh, in clinical practice uh, median nerve okay median nerve is also quite easily palpable Uh, this is a you know uh, flexor retinaculum area so median nerve can be felt here but it is under the flexor retinaculum so a bit difficult to feel actually whereas ulnar nerve is very easy because it is right uh, behind the uh, medial epicondyle this is common peroneal nerve and see this this is greater auricular nerve okay some other nerves are also shown here now see this this is how they are palpating now this picture which nerve are they palpating just tell me this picture ulnar ulnar excellent this is ulnar nerve palpation very good ulnar nerve what about this median median nerve median nerve 
this is median nerve very good median nerve and this one the third one peroneal common peroneal excellent common peroneal because this is the lateral side this is the fibula neck of the fibula is here so they are filling for the common peroneal nerve so in the exam you know we can easily include this picture to you and ask the question what the examiner is doing here like that question can be asked now some other pictures a bit of neurological here now see this which type of test are they doing here see this this one this one and this one and globe and stock exactly this is sensory testing very good this is sensory testing the examiner is trying to you know uh, if we touch very gently okay very gently this is a touch sensation if we press a little bit you know more with a pointed object this is a pain sensation now so touch and pain sensation temperature sensation is usually tested by test tube which are filled with warm and hot water that is very easy thing to do or if you have some cold things nearby you know you can also ask the patient to close the eye and then touch that particular area with the cold things or hot things but be careful that hot things should not be very hot so these are the different way of testing sensation now look at this you know other three pictures which are given at the bottom see this what type of testing are they ulnar nerve and median nerve and common peroneal nerve excellent very good okay so he has already you know given us the diagnosis and he's all is absolutely correct here see this this is okay uh, the testing of ulnar nerve actually this this is the little finger okay little finger and there are different muscles which are present in our hand these are called intrinsic muscles of the hand like dorsal and palmar interosei dorsal and palmar interosei all of these are supplied by ulnar nerve and the function of this dorsal and palmar interosei are anybody there is a famous mnemonic here like d a b okay and p a d now let me explain this so that you will never forget d stands for dorsal interosei and they are responsible for abduction abduction and p stands for palmar interosei which are responsible for adduction now what is abduction and what is adduction adduction towards the body towards the middle away from the body towards the body towards the body abduction away from excellent away from the body. very good abduction away from the body and adduction towards the body okay now ask the patient to stay in the anatomical position okay first always ask the patient to stay in the anatomical position and then you do this test if the uh, fingers are going away from each other now now see this we are testing the little finger here if this little finger is moving away from the ring finger and we call it abduction in this case this is in in uh, comparison to the other finger if we are uh, testing uh, the middle finger for example okay you should take one as a reference and if you move away from that that is called abduction if you move it towards the finger it is adduction so this is the meaning now you already got the got the idea here abduction is done by dorsal interosei adduction is done by palmar interosei and all of these muscles are supplied by ulnar nerve very good now this second one okay the second one uh, this is called which muscle they are testing here can you tell me the name of this muscle here anybody extensor and is a pollicis pollicis longus brevis extensor pollicis longus longus brevis now uh, see here pollicis now now i already got got the answer from one of the student here now now listen okay i want to say a little bit more about it this is the thinar eminence this is called thinar eminence okay and there are different oh. types of muscle present now here 
the examiner is testing ulnar nerve. So only one muscle here is supplied by ulnar nerve and that is called adductor pollicis. Adductor, A-D, adductor pollicis. Because moving the thumb in this direction is called, okay, adduction, okay, ad ad abduction of the, of the thumb. So if, if the person cannot do that, you know, this is uh, the problem of uh, ulnar nerve. Means nerve damage is, has been tested here. This is the motor function which they are testing. Okay, so see this? What, which nerve they are testing here and what is this, this function actually? What is it is called? This is dorsiflexion of the Dorsi foot. Dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion. Yes, this is dorsiflexion and dorsiflexion of the foot is the function of common peroneal nerve. Common peroneal nerve. If common peroneal nerve is damaged, a dorsiflexion cannot occur. Okay, so the examiner is uh, applying some of the force and then asking the patient uh, to do it against the force. Now, let's make this as a last slide for today. So let me summarize all the things with what I tell you till now. Now see this, this is the a classification of leprosy according to ridley joplin classification tuberculoid leprosy we call it tt borderline tuberculoid bt borderline 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 lepromatous and lepromatous leprosy the most severe one when i go towards the tuberculoid type cell mediated immunity is intact it is not decreased when i move towards lepromatous leprosy type cell mediated immunity is severely decreased. See this? It's a good cell mediated immunity. When I go toward this side, it is severely reduced. Okay. On the other hand, sorry, on the other hand, the antibody response is more in lepromatous leprosy type because it is a systemic type of involvement. The antigen exposure is much higher here. So antibody formation is also high. And these are the different cytokine expression, okay? Uh, interleukin 2, interferon gamma, 4 and 10. Okay? Many others are also there. Re re regarding the number of mycobacterium lepre in the tissue, it is much more higher in the lepromatous leprosy type. That's why according to WHO, it is known as multibacillary leprosy, whereas tuberculoid type is called pausibacillary leprosy. And one more thing is also shown here. There are two types of leprosy reaction, type one and type two. Type one is called reversal reaction, okay? And type two is called erythema nodosum leprosum, ENL, erythema nodosum leprosum. So see that this type one reaction can occur in any type of leprosy, any. But erythema nodosum leprosum is mainly seen in lepromatous type of leprosy. And when I go towards the tuberculoid, it is less common. Now let's talk about a lepra reaction. What do you mean by them? Now these lepra reactions are acute on chronic reaction. Means leprosy is a chronic disease. We all know that. So on top of that chronic disorder, some acute episodes of clinical inflammation occur time and again. And this is known as lepra reaction. So there are two types of lepra reaction, type one and type two. Type one lepra reaction is also known as reversal reaction. This is another term. Whereas type two lepra reaction is known as ENL, erythema nodosum leprosum. Okay, because of the typical appearance, the name is given, erythema nodosum leprosum. Now, this lepra reaction, they signify changes in the immunity of the patient. Sometimes the immunity is getting weaker, sometimes a little bit, you know, better than before. These are the different points. And they increase morbidity due to nerve damage even after the completion of treatment. They can occur anytime, these lepra reaction, especially type one. So during the reaction, neuritis is one of the important feature. 
So they can increase the morbidity because of the knob damage even after the completion of treatment. Let's move on. Now, a person with uh, leprosy can have a reaction at almost any time. Now, see this? He can have reaction before treatment, he can have reaction during treatment, and he can have reaction after treatment. So this is the hallmarks of leprotic reaction. And in a multibacillary leprosy, reaction can occur any time during the treatment or even several years after the treatment has been completed. Now, this is quite an interesting type of you know, disorder. Now let's look at the mechanism of this disorder, then you'll understand. Now, type one lepra reaction or reversal reaction occur because of increased cellular reactivity to mycobacterial product by our immune system. So this mycobacteria, mycobacterium leprae, is continuously releasing some of the substance from it. And there is increased reaction to those substances by our immune system that can give rise to type 1 lepra reaction. See here, chemotherapy, pregnancy, concurrent infection in the body, and even emotional and physical stress have been identified as a predisposing condition to the reaction. Type 1 lepra reaction is characterized by edema and erythema of the existing skin lesion. Now, whatever skin lesions are there, if I'm talking about, you know, borderline type of, you know, leprosy, then uh, there is erythematous patch present on the skin, and they are already anesthetic patch. This is the hallmark of leprosy, isn't it? On top of that, that patch will become more edematous because of type 1 reaction. There may be formation of new skin lesion apart from that. There may be neuritis or inflammation of the nerve. There may be additional sensory and motor loss, which was not there before. And there may be edema of the hands and feet or even the face, okay, in this disorder. But systemic symptoms are uncommon. Like there will be no fever, okay? There will be no arthralgia, no myalgia, like that. But more important are skin features and the knob features. The presence of inflammatory infiltrate with the predominance of CD4 T cell, differentiated macrophages, and thickened epidermis have been observed in the reversal reaction. This is because of the involvement of immune system there. Okay, let's move on. Now, let's talk about uh, some more points about type 1 liver reaction. It usually occur within the first six months of treatment. Usually occur within the first six months of the treatment, though it can occur any time, but that is more common. Most commonly occur in borderline patient, but also in borderline tuberculoid and borderline lepromatous. So just remember borderline, all, all three are different types of borderline leprosy, isn't it? This is borderline tuberculoid BT. This is borderline borderline, and this is borderline lepromatous. And it is one of the major cause of knob damage in a patient of leprosy. So this is type 1 lepra reaction. Now, during examination, what are we going to see? Or what are we going to find in the patient? What are the signs of type 1 lepra reaction? In the skin, there are inflamed skin patches. If they are already there, okay, for example, if there is a you know, hypopigmented patch on the skin, now that hypopigmented patch will become inflamed, so it looks red. And if there is already a bit of erythematous patch before, that erythematous patch will become further red. This is the result of inflammation. In the nerve, there is pain or tenderness in the nerve when we palpate. There is new loss of sensation and new muscle weakness. These are the features of neuritis as a result of a reversal reaction. In the eye, you see that there is pain 
and redness in the eye. Okay, this is a sign of inflammation. There is a new loss of vision, and there is new weakness in eye closure. Now, what term we use if the patient cannot close the eye? Yes. Anybody? If the patient is, you know, if you ask the patient to close, uh, close the eye and patient is unable to close, what we call that? It is known as lagophthalmos. Lagophthalmos means eyelids are lagging behind. They are not able to close the eye. So lagophthalmos is a feature of uh, which, which muscle is responsible for the closure of eye? Which muscle is that? Yes. Which muscle? Anybody? Orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis oculi. Exactly. Absolutely correct. Orbicularis oculi. And orbicularis oculi is supplied by which nerve? Which nerve? Seven. Seven. Seven, Seven. nerve. Exactly. Seventh cranial nerve or facial nerve. So you, you understand now what I'm trying to explain here that facial nerve may get affected because of this reaction and then eye closure may be a problem. So the reaction may involve the skin, the nerve and the eye, and it often only obvious in one or two places. It may not be generalized throughout the body. So we need to find out uh, you know, these, these places. Look at this picture here. Okay, see here, this is swollen hand. Dorsum of the hands are swollen here. This is one of the feature. I look at these lesions here. These lesions may be there before, or these lesions may be the new one. And if they are already there before, there is extra inflammation there. And if these are the new one, okay, of course, they will in, uh, appear there with the inflammation. And this is even a typical. Okay, they are swollen and erythematous lesion. Now, this is a closed view. See there, how, how uh, you know, edematous are they and how erythematous they look. Now, some differential diagnosis will exist here. Okay, uh, one of that is fungal infection. We already discussed about to differentiate between the fungal infection and leprosy. Uh, every student can answer what investigation are done. Uh, to confirm the leprosy, we need to take slit skin smear and send that to the lab and they will uh, do that acid fast bacilli stain and tell us what type of bacilli is there, okay? But for the confirmation of fungi, we do KOH mount or potassium hydroxide, uh, you know, mount and we can see fungi there. So established skin lesion have increased inflammation and there are new swollen lesion in case of borderline lepromatous and lepromatous patient. There may be acute neuritis, pain and tenderness in the nerve. And because of that, there is loss of function. And in case of a recent type of reversal reaction that is less than six months, okay, all these things are commonly seen. Now, these are the nerve which we uh, routinely examine in a case of leprotic patient. Yesterday also I showed this picture. So see that ulnar nerve, common peroneal nerve, even the median nerve, and here is greater auricular nerve. Okay, these are the nerves which are commonly examined. Now, let's talk about type 2 lepro reaction, also known as erythema, nodosum, leprosum. It occurs when large number of leprosy bacilli are killed and decomposed, and this can happen during the treatment. Proteins from the dead bacilli provoke an allergic reaction. So this leads to ENL. Systemic inflammatory response occur to extravascular immune complex. Extravascular immune complex are formed by antigen antibody reaction. Antigens comes out from the bacilli and antibody from our immune system. Now, during the process, Neutrophils are involved there, okay, and there is activation of the complement. So if you if you involve all these things together, you know this 
this erythema nodosum leprosum is an important example of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. There is high circulating levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha, this is a type of cytokine which is involved, and it has got systemic toxicity. It is more common in lepromatous leprosy, which is already a systemic disease. On top of that, it has multiple systemic features as well. Let's move on. Now, what are the signs of a reaction in erythema, nodosum, leprosum? See here. More commonly seen in severe type of leprosy, like borderline lepromatous and lepromatous patient. It is associated with regular use of clofazimine in okay, multiple drug therapy. This multiple drug therapy is the term we use for treatment of tuberculosis and leprosy because we don't use only one drug, you know, we use the combination of therapy. So clofazimine is one of the anti-leprotic drug and uh, this uh, lepra reaction is associated with the regular use of it. It may develop at any stage of the therapy, usually uh, within the first year. Okay, so it's another important point and it is often recurrent type of reaction. So recur again and again. So the common features of erythema, nodosum, leprosum are fever and malaise are quite common because this is an extensive inflammation going on, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction going on. The painful erythematous nodules present typically over the extensor surface of the limb. Remember the term nodosum, okay? Erythema nodosum. So there are erythematous nodules present mainly on the extensor surface of the limb. These nodules may become widespread and they may develop into pustule and even ulcerate later on. So pus formation, they may fill with pus and they may ulcerate as well. At the same time, neuritis or inflammation of the nerve would develop and these are the painful condition. And uh, when they complicate, they may develop into nerve abscess as well. So this is a bit more complicated situation than reversal reaction. Now look at this uh, different picture. These are the lumps or the erythematous, you know, nodules which may be developed. Okay, they are painful and red. Though in the picture they don't look uh, very red. Okay, but probably this is not a very you know uh, closed on view. This is taken from a bit of distance. There are few or many in number on the body of the patient predominantly present in the legs and arms, especially on the extensor surface, less frequently on the trunk, and they are not associated with the skin lesion. They are new one, okay? These are the new lesions which are present there. So this is type two leprosy reaction or erythema nodosum leprosum. Now, let's see some of the picture here. Look at this patient. This is very typical. See here, these are the nodules, erythematous nodules. Some are ulcerated as well. Okay, though uh, more common on the extensor surface of the body, but they can be found on the trunk. They're less common on the trunk, but we have not said, you know, it is not found there. Okay, so this is the involvement of the eye. See this. Now, uh, this is called cornea. So let me uh, take this opportunity to tell something about the eye also. Uh, this is cornea, you all can see, okay? This is called limbus, limbus. Here is cornea. This is pupil, right at the center, pupil, okay? And this is called sclera, sclera, this white part. Uh, conjunctiva are of different types. This is eyelid. So conjunctiva, which is covering the eyelid is called palpebral conjunctiva. And the conjunctiva, which is covering the bulb of the eye, this scleral part is called bulbar conjunctiva, palpebral and bulbar. And there is an active inflammation going on in sclera here, okay? So this is episcleritis and scleritis. Now, 
now. Now, see there, these are the some other signs of lepra reaction, especially type 2 lepra reaction, that is erythema nodosum leprosum. It has got feature of widespread immune complex deposition. That is a hallmark of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, like small vessel vasculitis, iridocyclitis. Iridocyclitis is an inflammation of iris okay, and the ciliary body. Polyarthritis, inflammation of multiple joints. Orchitis, what is orchitis? Inflammation of Excellent. Inflammation of testes. Okay. Orchitis is inflammation of testes in male. Lymphadenitis, lymph node enlargement. And I am just Who is that? You know, she has disturbed all of us. Okay, fine. So glomerulonephritis is another one, which is the inflammation of glomeruli there. So these all are the different types of, you know, manifestation caused by deposition of immune complex. Let's move on. Now, we have gone through type 1 reaction and type 2 reaction. So let's talk about some of the differences between them. Regarding the, uh, you know, inflammation in type 1 reaction, see there, the leprotic paths may be already there or there may be, you know, appearance of the new patches in type 1, both things may be there, okay? The leprosy patches are inflamed, but the rest of the skin is normal in type 1. Though the new patches appear, you know, only problem occurs in the patches the rest of the skin will be fine. In type 2 reaction, there will be appearance of the new red lump, or you can say nodule, new red nodule, and these are tender, okay? These are tender, and they are not associated with the leprosy patches. I mean, they are very new one. They do not occur in the same area where already there are patches. So this is a very important difference between the type 1 and type 2. Regarding the general condition of the patient, it is quite good in type 1 because it is not a systemic type of illness, whereas in type 2, it is poor. And on top of that, type 2 more commonly occur in severe type of leprosy, where the patient's condition is already a bit poor. Regarding the timing, it usually occur early on the course of multidrug therapy, people with both pausy bacillary and multibacillary leprosy can develop it, okay? Having said that, it is again more common in multibacillary leprosy, like borderline type of leprosy are more, more commonly having a uh, reversal reaction. And type two only occur in multibacillary leprosy. There is no chance of pausibacillary leprosy with developing it, and usually occur later in the course. Regarding the eye involvement in type one, there is weakness of eyelid closer, because of the nerve involvement, lagophthalmos may be there. Whereas in type 2, even internal eye disease is possible uh, along with weakness of the eyelid closure, like scleritis, episcleritis, or even iridocyclitis. So these are some of the important uh, differences. Now, we are coming towards the end of this topic. What are the uh, common complications of Hansen's disease or leprosy? So one type of complication is due to Hansen's disease per se, means because of the Hansen's disease itself, complications are there. And these are loss of sensation. And if loss of sensation occurs in the foot area, remember there may be chances of development of ulcer and those ulcers are very difficult to heal. Due to reactions, complications can be there. Type 1 lepra reaction, type 2 lepra reaction. There is further damage to the nerve. There is, uh, you know, appearance of the motor symptom now, weakness, okay? Neuritis, nerve abscess, different other problem. Due to anti 
leprotic drug side effects may be there okay and then due to drugs used in the reaction treatment we we often use corticosteroid for the treatment of this reaction uh, we we can use thalidomide for the you know uh, treatment of reaction so they, they this drug can have some of the side effects so this is how the complications can be listed All of you, please focus here uh, on the on the picture. What can you see here? See, what can I see here in this this picture? See this? What is this? Yes. This is a skin. A lot of cream formation. Yeah, the skin is cracked, right? This is cracking of the skin, isn't it? Now. Uh, this may be seen in farmers or the people who do not wear shoes or slipper now i'm not talking about that now but you know this type of people they do not have sensation i'm talking about leprosy here they do not have sensation here so even if they develop this type of thing they ignore it it, it, it may not cause any pain it may not cause any other feeling there so they ignore it and within few days it will keep on increasing maybe it is secondarily infected now and it will develop into ulcer and things like that so right at this phase it should be treated means proper care should be provided to this foot okay and that is the job of uh, other uh, you know people who are uh, who are there at the home or if this patient is admitted in the hospital then hospital should take care of this especially the nurses now look at this picture here it's very typical now can you tell me what's going on here in this picture just focus leg of the patient the patient is close one eye but the other eye can be closed unilateral facial nerve paralysis unilateral good okay Somebody told me lagophthalmos. Good. This is called lagophthalmos. Yes, I agree. But uh, rather, uh, you know, along with lagophthalmos, uh, look at this uh, deviation of the angle of the mouth. See here. Look at this deviation. It is deviated towards this side. See, a little bit upward, and here it is drooping downward, drooping downward, and this is called nasolabial fold. i can see nasolabial fold here but there is no nasolabial fold i can see on this side a person cannot close the eye on this side but person is closing the eye nicely on this side so which part of the face is paralyzed which part right right side right. of the face very good this is the right side excellent right side okay this is right side it is paralyzed i am very happy so this this type of you know diagnosis you have to do when we show this type of picture now because we have done everything before excellent so this may be one of the complication of leprosy either by the disease itself or because of the reaction during the treatment uh, so this uh, this things can be there very good facial nerve paralysis on the right side now see there this is a small ulcer which is about to form and this if if, if this is not uh, taken care of you know this will keep on increasing and even the bone which is underlying it can be affected so even osteomyelitis can be there uh, because of this type of problem if they are ignored and look at this uh, this area already a rounded type of ulcer is formed and one important term is given for this type of ulcer they are known as neuropathic ulcer neuropathic ulcer so see the neuropathic ulcer means they are developed because of the nerve damage or destruction and they are very difficult to treat now here is another picture which is showing a corneal ulcer formation now what is the connection between a corneal ulcer and leprosy anyone so how probably yes. this the seven seven nerve is paralysis the eye cannot be closed 
So due to multiple infection, that can lead to uh, corneal ulcer. Good, good, very good explanation. Anybody else? Excellent. Anybody? He is absolutely right. Now, rather than leprotic bacilli itself, it leads to paralysis of the or destruction of or damage of the seventh cranial nerve. The person cannot close the eye now, okay? And it can lead to exposure keratitis, exposure keratitis. And because of that exposure keratitis, corneal ulcer may develop there. And this is how the corneal ulcer is examined, okay? It's a stain and clearly uh, this area is defective corneal ulcer. This is a serious type of disease. Now, there is a scleritis. Scleritis or episcleritis, we say, is one of the manifestation, especially because of, you know, reaction type one or type two lepra reaction, mainly type two. Now, finally, uh, what is the treatment of leprosy? Now, uh, for the, you know, sake of the treatment, we have divided leprosy or Hansen's disease into two types, pausy bacillary Hansen's and multi bacillary Hansen's. Now, pausy bacillary uh, is treated in a different way than multi bacillary. Now, look at this. Okay, this is the pausy bacillary treatment. This is a multi bacillary treatment. Now, uh, commonly, this type of questions will be asked to you here. Once a month, okay, uh, this treatment is given. That is, day one, two capsules of rifampicin is given to the patient. That is, one capsule is equivalent to 300 milligram. So, 600 milligram of rifampicin is given on day one. And after that, every day, okay, once a month, sorry, once a month again, every day is here. Once a month, one tablet of dapsone is also given, and that dapsone is continued throughout the month. On day one, 100 milligram is given, and it will be continued from day two to day 28. That is dapsone. So let me make it easy again. Rifampicin and dapsones are used for the treatment of pausy bacillary leprosy. Rifampicin is just used, you know, on day one, and uh, you know, throughout other days of the month, we only use dapsone, and we use it for six months. So we have got six blister pack for pausy bacillary Hansen's disease treatment. Now look at this. It is so easy to use. See this every month, the two capsules of rifampicin, which are shared by you know this red color. Now it is done. And at the same day, one tablet of dapson is also given to the patient. Now it is finished on day one itself. And from day two, you don't have any rifampicin, only dapson is given till 28 day. Done. And if you repeat it for six months, treatment of pausy bacillary leprosy is done. What about multi bacillary now? See here. Once a month on day one, two capsules of rifampicin, just like pausy bacillary, three capsules of clofazimin now, that is the additional thing here, and one tablet of dapson, it is again the same. So, only difference here is clofazimin is added. And now from day two to day 28, one capsule of clofazimin is added on one tablet of dapson. And it is given for 12 months, means 12 blister pack are given. So very easy. If you look at this blister pack, this white is dapsone. Okay. These two are rifampicin. The upper three are clofazimine. So they are given in day one. And after that, see this uh, clofazimine every day and dapsone every day for 28 days. And we repeat this for 12 months. So this is the treatment of multi bacillary leprosy. Now, how these reactions are treated then? Okay, how this reversal reaction or uh, iridema nodosum leprosum are treated? For pausy bacillary patient, the standard treatment is as follows for the reversal reaction we give prednisolone, this is a corticosteroid. And this prednisolone is given in the tapering dose. You can notice here in one to two, in the first one to two week, 40 milligram, third to fourth week, 30, 
then gradually decrease up to five milligram when we reach 11 and 12 week, then it is stopped. Then it is stopped. And you all know why we are decreasing the dose. Why, why, why is this necessary? Why to decrease the dose and stop? Because it will cause uh, the reaction if we sudden stop it, the adrenal crisis will develop. The person will quit. Go HPX will be depressed. Uh, very good. Not secreted. Very good. So you still remember from our endocrine discussion. Excellent. Very good uh, reason you have given. See this. This prednisolone, which you have given from outside, is suppressing HPA axis, and it takes time for the recovery of that HPA axis. That's why we need to gradually taper the dose and stop. I cannot stop it suddenly when the dose is so high. Okay, patient uh, will develop uh, acute adrenal crisis. For multibacillary patient, the standard treatment is as follows, similar, prednisolone, okay? But uh, it is uh, given for a longer time. Now, what about erythema nodosum leprosum treatment? It is treated with the help of corticosteroid, okay? Clofazimine is continued and thalidomide can be given. Now, this is a bit of controversy here. The same clofazimine is associated with more uh, chances of ENL and uh, still we want to continue the drug because it is you know, one of the important drugs uh, in the treatment of leprosy itself. Okay, so corticosteroid will take care of that reaction here. Thalidomide is a banned drug these days. Okay, and uh, you cannot uh, buy it without the pre prescription of a doctor even in the free countries, in, in other countries, of course, uh, many other drugs cannot be bought without the prescription of a doctor. Uh, that is not the point I'm talking here. What is the side effect of thalidomide? Yes, if it is given in the pregnancy? Teratogenic. What term we use for that? Yes, you're right. It is teratogenic drug. So what it leads to the baby? It is known as? Focomelia. Okay. Focomelia. This focomelia is limb defect. Limb defect means those limb buds, they are not increasing in size. They are remaining just like that. The limb development is a problem. And this is known as focomelia. So, because of this, uh, you know, dreadful side effect. Thalidomide is not commonly used at all these days and is a banned type of drug. Only in this type of selected condition, you know, thalidomide can be tried uh, uh, if corticosteroids are not helpful. Now, apart from that, physiotherapy is a standard part of the therapy, active physiotherapy, passive physiotherapy, and different type of splints, either they are fixed or mobile, given to the patient so that, you know, uh, patients would be benefited, okay, from those neurological involvement.